So for genetics, and, and we're focusing on bacterial genetics, and one of the main reasons why we talk about that is because that's what leads to this ability to genetically change leads to a lot of the antibiotic resistance that we see, right? So this is, this is um, important in understanding how that phenomenon happens. How is it that a bacteria becomes resistant to antibiotics? And how is that information um, shared with other bacteria? So there's several terms, right? This is kind of just a glossary of terms that we're going to go through as we go throughout the lecture. So there's three different mechanisms, right? And one of them, I gave you guys two examples. I gave you a, a, a cellular example for us and um, one for a bacteria. And that's all we're going to talk about that one. And anybody remember which of the three that was an example of where E. coli in your gut only makes the enzymes to digest lactose when it's available? It only uses that information. What does that refer to as? So you have that DNA, right? There's a term that we use when you turn that DNA into messenger RNA and then into proteins. That DNA has been, I don't know, it's on the next slide. Flip ahead in your notes. Then we're all going to say it together. Expression. Ready? Expression, right? So expression of genetic information, right? That's one way an organism can respond to changing environments, right? You have this information. You don't always express it. So did anybody remember the cellular example I gave you guys of this where the cell chooses or is told what to express? Everybody was sleeping on me. Okay. What cells need to make hemoglobin? Red blood cells, right? Red blood cells need to make that in abundance, that protein, right? So they express that information. Does that mean that, say, a skin cell doesn't have the information in its DNA on how to make that protein called hemoglobin? No, it's in its DNA. It just doesn't express it doesn't utilize it. It's not its job, right? It has other jobs. Like, for instance, maybe making the protein keratin, right? That's something a skin cell would make. Make sense? So that for that, that level of change, that's the extent of the discussion on that, right? Of those two examples that I gave you to help explain that. We're now going to start diving in deeper to mutation all the different types of mutations. And mutation it can be passed from the mom all the way down to all her daughters. Because remember, bacteria basically only have mommies, no daddies, for the most part. So this is vertical gene transfer. And then next time we'll look at horizontal, where it can go from cousin to cousin, something like that. I just clicked on the wrong thing. Too many computers in front of me. So, vertical, a mutation happens, right? She pa It doesn't get fixed. She passes it on to all her babies. Horizontal, some, some genetic information can move. And there's three different ways we're going to talk about this can happen. But then notice that once it moves horizontally, it can also then be passed on vertically, right? And stuff that's been passed on vertically right, could then be passed on to a cousin horizontally, right? So this stuff is continuously moving, this information is moving throughout the population and populations of bacteria. And this leads to change, right? Because it is change, right down to the DNA level. And the DNA <coughs> allows you to do things, make things, be as you are. So when we start talking about the genetic information, that code that you have is your genotype, right? Right down to the DNA code, the A's, the G's, the T's, and the C's, that's your genotype. 
as little as one of those little basis changes, an A for a T or a G for a C or, or some other switch, can, can completely change what we refer to as your phenotype. Right? So in the case of hemoglobin, one little change in your genotype, one little code change, could cause you to make hemoglobin that is different from everyone else. Right? That mutation, that change in your genotype, in the code, will get you to produce a different protein, and that protein is the physical expression of the genotype. It's what we call the phenotype, right? It is the physical expression of the genetic information. So can you get changes in the genotype and then not affect the phenotype? Actually, you can. You can. You can have a change in that genotype and you still make the same protein as everybody else. And so we're going to talk about how is that possible, right? The next is haploid versus diploid. So, for instance, probably the easiest one for people to realize is blood typing, right? And the ABO blood group, that group of antigens. You can have the A antigen, you're said to have the A blood type. You can have the B antigen, you said to have the B blood type. You can also be AB, which means that you produce both the A and B antigen on the surface of your blood, red blood cells. How is that possible? That you could have both? Where'd that information come from? Your parents, right? You have two of them, yes? A mom and a dad. Mom gave you one, dad gave you the other. You're what's referred to as diploid, right? So for that genetic information, for instance, markers that you can make for your red blood cells, you get a, you get a copy from mom and a copy from dad. Now they can be slightly different. For instance, in the ABO blood group, you can have an A or a B. Or you can have nothing like me, right? Where you don't put any extra stuff. Uh, that's antigenic on the surface of your red blood cell. That's O, right? O for zero, naked, nothing. Bacteria. They got mommies and daddies? No, just mom. So guess how many copies they have of most of their genetic information? One. They're what's referred to as haploid. So diploid is two copies, haploid is one. We do have cells in our body that are haploid. What do we call them? Girls have got them and boys have got them. The cells. What are the cells called? Your gametes. In the case of a girl, it's a egg. In the case of a boy, it's what? Sperm. Right? Those cells are haploid. Right? It's been, the information's been divided in half. What information you pass on to your children is random, right? But you have two sets, one for mom, one for dad. Whether you give your dad set to your kids or your mom, or usually a mixture of the both, right, is randomly determined in your sex organs, right? So in the testes, in the ovaries. But we split it in half. So that when you come together now, you have double that. You have what's called diploid. So that's great, especially when it comes to genetic disease, right? So remember before I talked about sickle cell anemia. That again is a defect in the ability to make hemoglobin properly. You make it, but it's not quite the good stuff and it deforms your cells. Because you make so much of this protein, your cells will typically use both of the sets um, or alternate between the both the choices that you got from either one of your parents. So if your one of your parents gave you a good copy, chances are about half of the cells that are made may be using that good copy. But they don't shut down the other copy. 
So the crappy copy you get from one of the other parents, right, that has the sickle cell trait that makes the crappy hemoglobin, about half your cells will unfortunately use that information and make crappy hemoglobin and the cells deform and become sickle shaped. Okay. To have full blown sickle cell anemia means you got two bad copies. Both mom and dad gave you defective copies of that information and all your cells get made sickle cell. But for some other diseases, you really only need one good dominant copy. So if you have a defective copy, it's no big deal, right? You're lucky. You don't have a genetic defect because your body really only needs one copy, and you got a good copy from one of your parents. We usually typically have genetic disease when you get two defective copies. Both the copies you got from both your parents can't do the job it needs to do. All right, so the only one that's popping into my head right now is PKU. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> um, that's a, a genetic defect they test for in the hospital and won't let your kid go home nowadays even. Um, and so they're testing to see if they have the ability to take the amino acid phenylalanine and convert it into um, other amino, essential amino acids that we use. Some people do not have that enzymatic ability, right? Neither one of the parents gave them the effective enzyme, the DNA to make that effective enzyme. So children in that case, it, uh, phenylalanine builds up in their body because they're not able to convert it. So then they have to be on a special diet so that they don't have excess phenylalanine, too much of that protein building up in their body because they can't convert it. Does that make sense? And again, it's down to genetics, the fact that, you know, the parents gave them two defective copies, right? They can't do what they need to do. Does that make sense? Okay, so for bacteria, then the next one, so identify why genetically bacteria are at a disadvantage then that they are haploid instead of diploid. So we just said, when do you usually have genetic disease? When you have two defective copies. How many copies does a bacteria have? One. So if mommy gave them one copy that is defective, guess what? They're at a disadvantage. They can't do something. Now, depending on how important that something is to life, right, and especially if mom had a, a genetic defect that made it impossible to live, she wouldn't have babies, right? But it, maybe it's a minor defect where you have to have a particular nutrient in the environment. And if you don't have it, you can't convert other things like the PKU problem, right? So you'd be great. You'd be able to survive in an environment if that nutrient was available. If it's not available, you're going to die off, right? We call that situation what? where you're culling the ones that cannot survive in that environment. No. Only the fittest survive. So survival of the fittest or natural selection. So the environment plays a role, but we are always, we and the microorganisms are always constantly changing, right? Mistakes get made in the code, and in this case, that would be a bad situation right? If now you no longer can survive in the environment, so you're deleted. But what if it's, you know, you made a ribosome that's faster than everyone else's ribosomes? So you can make proteins 10 times faster than anyone else. That'd be a pretty good adaptation, right? You would be more fit, too, for that, for just about any environment, if you can do something faster than anyone else. In the case of, think about now antibiotics, right? If now you have a ribosome that erythromycin, an antibiotic that interferes with ribosomes with their protein synthesis, it can no longer bind to it and interfere with that process. Is that good? It's good for the bacteria. Not so good for us, though, right? <laughs> Remember, from the perspective of the bacteria, that's a good thing, right? If, if you now have a ribosome that's resistant to erythromycin, you're going to be more predominant, especially in an environment where erythromycin may be present, because it's going to affect the other bacteria, but it's not going to affect you. You're going to survive. You're more fit for that environment. You're going to be selected for by that environment. 
So again, the pressure of us using antibiotics makes so that what we have left are a lot of resistant bacteria, right? Because we use antibiotics so much that who's going to survive? The ones that are resistant. Right? The ones we selected for. Not intentionally, but we've done it. The environment has done it. So, mutations are related to natural selection. How is that related? Mm -hmm. So the organisms are changing, right? They're mutating from the original. If, depending on that change, the environmental pressure is going to select who's going to be most fit for that environment at that time. Who's going to survive? So the environment doesn't cause the mutations, although there are some things in our environment that are mutagenic, right, that could cause things. But the environment in general does not cause an organism to mutate. Organisms naturally mutate over time. But the environment is going to put that selective pressure as to which mutations are going to be termed good versus bad. They're going to select. So a genetic change alters the genotype, right? When you have a genetic change, it's right down to that code, that A's, G's, T's, and C's. This can be profound. This can be very large impact for bacteria because they're haploid. So that one precious copy they have on how to make some particular enzyme, if that gets messed up, that could be very bad for them. If it gets improved, though, Right? If the functionality of that enzyme becomes better, that could be good. But because they have just that one copy, that one copy is going to determine their phenotype. Right? What they can make, what can they do. Unlike us, right? because we have two copies, if there's a change in one, that wouldn't necessarily phenotypically um, affect us because we could potentially use that other copy. Just depends on how our body uses that information and at what rate. For them, there isn't any choices. One copy, that's it. So we see the change in their ability and what they can do so much faster. No backup copies. So earlier I had said that you could have a change in the genotype and it not affect the phenotype. The reason for that is how the code is read by our bodies. So by no means do I expect you guys to memorize this, right, or this next table, but understand how this works, okay? So there are what we call 64 codons in the code of DNA. Codons are groups of three nucleotides read together by the ribosome that code for a particular amino acid. 61 of them, that is, code for a specific amino acid. We call these sense codons. They kind of make sense, right? They code for something. The three remaining are what we call nonsense codons or stop codons. They tell the ribosome, stop here. Why they need to be told to stop, I don't know. You think they get to the end of the message and just know to stop, <laughs> right? Uh, but I think that um, there's actually code after that, and that's so that it doesn't deteriorate, so they don't lose it. Um, and we modify our DNA extensively where um, for bacteria, they'll actually... Uh, make a really long messenger RNA that actually codes for a whole bunch of proteins within, say, a biochemical pathway. 
So think of glycolysis. You guys remember glycolysis, right? The breakdown of glucose. There are several enzymes that are used. So they will actually make a really long messenger RNA, and a whole bunch of ribosomes will attach at the same time. And so they'll make all the proteins at the same time, all the enzymes necessary for that pathway. So having stops in between helps the ribosome know, okay, I finished that protein, right? Hop on to the next segment, make the next protein. So stop, stops are necessary, so they know, you know, what piece is what. So, um, here, let me go to this next slide. So, remember your DNA, the, the nucleotides, right, that are in DNA, they're abbreviated A, T, Gs, and Cs, right? Um, for adenine, thymine, cytosine, guanine, right? This is, this is that difference, that nitrogenous base that is the code for us. And there, there are four different ones for DNA. Now for RNA, there's one missing. Which one? T. T's are gone, right? You have instead uracil use. So that's one way you know if you're looking at, when you're looking at code, if you're looking at DNA or RNA. If it's DNA, you'll see T's. If it's RNA, you'll see U. So in this case, we're looking at RNA. We're looking at what's called the transcript. And so I always think of, you know, translation, transcription. Sometimes people get confused with that, right? So this is my little story that I tell myself that keeps me straight. So for DNA to RNA, that's transcription, right? It's basically in the same language. It's nucleotides, right? It's in the same chemical language. So as I'm talking right now, you guys are writing a transcript. I'm pretty sure you're writing in the same language as I'm speaking, right? Probably for most of you. But then when we go from, so we've gone RNA, excuse me, DNA to RNA. That's a transcript, right? We're writing a message that can then travel, right? That transcript can then travel out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm or maybe even to the rough endoplasmic reticulum, in the case of our cells. The ribosomes are going to attach to that transcript, to that message that's in the same language, but now we're going to change the language. We're going to go from nucleotides to amino acids to make proteins. Do you see how the chemicals are changing, how the molecules are changing? We're going from messenger RNA, which is nucleotides, to proteins, which are amino acids. So what are we doing? Translation. There's a reason for these names. Right? Now we're translating. So, you know, now you go home and take your notes and write them in French or Spanish or whatever you want. You could translate it. Make sense? So how does the ribosome know which amino acid to put there? Well, it's in the code. Well, how does it read the code? This is how in these groups of three. So each time it sees three, that's a codon that means something to that ribosome. And in fact, more so the transfer RNA that comes in. Because the ribosome is matching up those transfer RNAs that have an anti-codon to this codon. They have the reverse of this. So in the case of UUU, instead it's, anyone know? AAA, right? So that, that um, transfer RNA that's carrying the amino acid, and in this case, the transfer RNA that has the, the anticodon that matches this one, AAA, is phenylalanine. This three-letter abbreviation, all these ones in blue, are all amino acids. Anyone know how many naturally occurring amino acids there are? 20. And how many different codons did we say are here? 64, but three of them are stopped, so 61 of them code for amino acids. Wait a minute, 61, 20. What do we see here? You see that there isn't one codon, one amino acid, right? There's several codons, one amino acid. So for instance, proline here, it's just going to have a CC in the first, it doesn't matter, it could be any one of the four in the third position, it's still going to be proline. So there's some redundancy here. 
So if a mistake is made in the copy in the DNA and it's passed on, if it isn't in a position where it's going to change the amino acid, then it's not going to have a phenotypic change. Right? If you don't change amino acid, the protein's the same. The code change, the phenotype, the protein, the expression of that information is the same because of this redundancy. So there's one special codon, AUG, codes for the amino acid methionine. And for bacteria that don't really modify stuff like eukaryotes do, their first amino acid in most of their proteins is phenylalanine because this one tells the ribosome what? It's green. Go, start here. <laughs> That's the start codon. All right? That's where the ribosome starts, matching up those transfer RNAs and attaching those amino acids in the sequence that's being told by the messenger RNA based on these groups of three nucleotides known as codons. So again, by no means memorizing this, right, but understanding how this code works. So spontaneous um, mutations are rare. Why would you think they'd be rare? They don't happen very often. We have repair mechanisms. But why would we want to repair it? Change is good, right? Is it always good? No, it could be bad, right? It could be very bad. You could change, especially for bacteria, you could change the code, change the protein, and no longer be able to do something that you need to, to to live. Can you imagine if you can, like if you were a gram-negative bacteria, and now you can't make porin proteins anymore. Where are the porin proteins? In the outer membrane of the gram-negative bacteria. This allows stuff to get in and out that outer membrane. You think that cell is going to survive without porin proteins? No. That would be a lethal change. That would be very bad. So although change can be good, it can also be very bad. So typically the cell is going to repair. But again, not always the repairs don't always get made, right? We make mistakes. And sometimes we get lucky and that's a good mistake, right? And the same holds true for them. So they occur in the natural environment, right? But they occur infrequently and randomly. Like where they happen, right, exactly in the code is very random. The probability of a mutation will be observed in a given gene each time the cell divides. This rate can vary extensively, right? Some organisms are more prone to mutation than others. Will happen one in every 10,000 cell cycles, right? They'll make a mistake. Or it might be one in a trillion times that that cell divides. So as you can imagine, that's really going to vary from cell to cell. E. coli under ideal conditions, can copy itself every 20 minutes. Where mycobacteria leprae takes about a day or two to replicate itself. So as you can imagine, the, the potential of mutation rate would be much higher for E. coli. It's copying more often than an organism that is going not as fast. But also depends on how much DNA are they copying, right? How much is there even? There's so many variables. It's mind-blowing. Mathematician would have way too much fun with it, right? Um, unlike the lottery where you can, they can actually calculate, right? Because we know, and again, for this they could calculate it, right? How many nucleotides are in that cell? How quickly does it copy, right? They could, 
they could mathematically figure out what's the potential that it would make a mistake. So similar to what's the odds that you'll win the lottery, right? But for this too, we do have mechanisms, they have mechanisms for repairing, right? Because making a mistake, not putting the right nucleotide there could be lethal. And so we really don't want too many mistakes to happen. So the good news for you guys is you're not in the general microbiology class. We're not going to go through all the mechanisms on how they repair. <laughs> we're just going to say they do it. Now we're going to look at um, the different types. Of course, we name everything, right? So there are three different types of mutations that can occur. One of them is base substitutions. And within base substitutions, there's three types of those, right? So let's do our little list. So mutations are where that change happens. It's not fixed by cellular repair. It's passed on to the next generation. That is a mutation in the DNA, in that sequence. Base substitutions can happen, right? Those nitrogenous bases, the A, B's, T, uh, I'm all right. I'm doing my alphabet instead of my code. A's, G's, T's, and C's, right? That code, those are called, those individual nucleotides, that code, that A, is referred to as a base, right? So if we substitute one for another, right? So instead of putting an A, we put a G instead. Depending on where that change is, we may produce a different amino acid, right? So because sometimes it'll result in change and other times it won't, or even worse, sometimes it'll cause us to put a stop code on there, there are three different possible outcomes from a base substitution that we're going to look at. Or we could remove or add extra bases. All right, so instead of just switching around, oh, nah, I'm just going to take that one. Or here, have an extra one. Sure, why not, right? Ooh, where do you see what happens when we do that? And then there are segments of DNA that can move throughout the chromosome and jump to other places. These are called transposable elements or transposons or sometimes they're referred to as jumping genes because literally they're moving from one spot to another. The problem is is that when they move they can disrupt other genes. And this is a natural phenomenon that actually a woman scientist discovered, Barbara McClintock. Um, and we actually utilize this um, natural phenomenon to our benefit in genetic research all the time. And so we'll talk about it here under natural um, conditions, but we'll also talk about it under induced conditions. So those are our three, right? Mutation happens by bases being swapped out one for another by adding or removing extra nucleotides or these transposable elements that move throughout the chromosome. So we're going to look at each one individually. So remember there are some animations and this one I'm just going to kind of scroll through and kind of do my own audio but you guys have links to these two on that page um, that I made available to you. So these, this is just showing out of the nucleotide, it's just showing the nitrogenous bases. Remember, DNA is double-stranded, and the two strands bond with each other via hydrogen bonds. So for these two guys, they have two hydrogen bonds between them. Uh, so I'm, it's probably adenine and um, a, a with T. I always remember AT&T, which surprisingly, I'm surprised that company's still around, but they're still around, right? So that one always helps me, right? A's with T's, I just think AT&T, right? And then G's with C's, G and C, they kind of look the same. The, those two letters are curved, so it makes sense that they go together. That's what always has worked for me many, many years. So if it helps you. Um, with the A's and the T's, it's, a, it's two hydrogen bonds 
For G and C, it's three hydrogen bonds. Um, so a little bit stronger bonding there. So that's how I'm able to deduce there that it's probably an, an A and a T. Um, although I'm sure they're going to tell us in a second. Aha, see? Adenine and thymine. So the other thing that you guys don't need to know for this class, but I'll give you a little tip if, you're, if you think you're going to go down that genetics road, which is a pretty cool road. Um, the, the nitrogenous bases themselves, you'll see how this one has two rings, right, in its structure. And this guy just has one. Um, purines have two rings. And we always remember angels are pure. And AG, adenine and guanine, are purines, right? Angels are pure. They have two rings just like Angels have two wings. You see the little play on words, right? And then the pyrimidines just have one. And some people, you know, this is kind of like a pyramid. A pyramid has one point. A pyramid has one ring. Um, these are your thymine, uh, uracil, and cytosine. But this is important. It's always a pyrimidine with a purine. So notice you always end up with three rings across for DNA. And this is important, like when Watson and Crick were figuring out the structure, if you think about it, the spacing and how the molecules interact with each other is how they were able to figure this out. And if you imagine that DNA is a spiral staircase, right, these nitrogenous bases are the steps, right, that you would step up. Off to the side you'd have, you know, the sugar that holds on to this and the phosphate group. And it's the sugar phosphate groups that kind of form that railing in the banister as you go up that spiral staircase, right, that links it all together. So imagine those steps are all the same width, right? They're all three rings across. Nice, beautiful, even steps to your spiral staircase. Looks beautiful, huh? That's beautiful. So imagine if you said to your carpenter, right, hmm, I want my steps to be three feet across and two feet and one feet in width. And I, I want it made into a spiral staircase. Yeah, you're shaking your head. Because that's what he's going to say. Lady, you are. No. No. Not possible. Structurally, it's not going to be sound, right? It's not going to hold together. And for DNA, structurally sound is extremely important, right? You want a molecule that's stable, that's going to stay together because it's carrying information, right? Very important information. So if it's not stable, right, it's not going to stay together. It's not going to be able to keep that information safe. And in the case of that spiral staircase, it would not be safe for you to go up the stairs, right? Well, think about this too. So, okay, obviously, so we've got to keep that base pairing as it's supposed to be so we can keep those nice, even width steps. Well, what about the spacing in between the steps? Is that important? Absolutely, right? You you don't want to be like one foot up and then three feet up. Be like, put a couple more steps in there, dude, right? Your enzymes, when they read this information, I just realized I'm walking away from my microphone. Um, when they read this information, they're like, imagine that little kid that loves to slide down the banister, the railing, right? They literally hook on to the sugar phosphate backbone and ride down that as it reads the information on the steps. So that structure is very important because the enzymes attached to it slide down it. If there's any inconsistencies in that, it's going to mess them up. So there are things that can happen to our DNA that kind of buckle or mess up that sugar phosphate backbone. One of them is if the steps aren't evenly spaced, right? So your cells are going to try and keep that nice, even spacing. Well, sometimes that means, oh, well, I'm just going to stick another nucleotide in there. Well, you'll find out that's not good news <laughs> as far as the code is, in, is uh, concerned. As far as, you know, the pretty architecture, everything's spaced out, right? That part, they're like, oh, it's pretty, it's happy. Not really when you look at the code, though. And what do we stick on banisters and stuff to keep kids from sliding down them, or adults that are big kids? 
They put those little bumps on them, right? Especially like escalators, like you see those bumps. Right? That's not like pretty. That's deterrent from sliding. Okay. We don't want any deterrence from sliding when it comes to our DNA, right? We want the enzymes to slide down. We don't want any bumps, right, in that banister, in that sugar phosphate backbone. We want everything nice and smooth and laid out. Make sense? So when you have changes that mess up that beautiful structure, you run into problems, okay? So for this one, adenine can, mute, can change in a particular way. Notice the extra hydrogen here. Bops over here. When that happens, it can bind to a different uh, pyrimidine than it's supposed to, right? Because A is supposed to be with what? It's supposed to be with T. But what is it binding to right here? C. So this is a base substitution, right? We just swapped out one base for another. Instead of having T there, we have C. Did we just change the code? Yeah. If this change stays, this could be passed on. But notice we still got the three rings across, right? So structurally, we're, we're still happy, right? The, the carpenter is not going to look at you like you're crazy. Here's another example, right, where you've got the, the base substitution, right? Guanine is supposed to be with cytosine, but oops, it's got thymine over here. So, Notice here, right, T is supposed to be there, but a C got put there instead. If that gets fixed such that now they're like, oh, the C is the correct one, we're just going to, you know, switch that out, right, we have a mutation that happened, so much so that when you look at that codon and you look it up on that chart, Originally, this codon was saying put lysine there to the ribosome. But now it's saying what? Arginine. Ooh, ooh. That's a phenotypic change, right? The genotype changed and the phenotype. What we make, the physical expression of that genetic information just changed. How important is that one amino acid? What you think? No big deal. We're good. Yeah, it can cause us a pretty serious problem, right? It could cause this protein to no longer fold how it's supposed to or do its job. It could be good. It could do its job better. It could have no change at all. The possibilities are that varied, right? Could be that, eh, no difference at all, really bad, doesn't do its job at all, or is really good now at doing its job. Depending on what effect that have is going to determine the likelihood that that cell survives, that organism survives in the environment. So because when we do a substitution, you can get a change like we just saw, or sometimes you won't get a change at all. So the definitions are on this slide, but I'm going to go to my next one. So you can, and this is just from that animation right here. This is showing you that there was a change, right? That that point mutation resulted in a mutant. But this one I like. It has all three possibilities on there. So this is the original nucleotide combination. This is the original codon. This is the original amino acids. It's supposed to code for just this one codon. These are the three different possibilities that could happen from a base substitution. You could have a change that, of course, changes the genotype, right? We've got a different codon here than here, right? We've got UAC now instead of UAU. But when you look at the chart, guess what? Still codes for tyrosine. So we call this a silent mutation. 
And you want to guess why like we call it a silent mutation? It doesn't make a change in what? The amino acid's the same, the phenotype's the same. You're going to make the exact same protein, right? So this is that one thing I said, does it, if the genotype change, does the phenotype have to change? No. A silent mutation could happen. It's still a mutation because what did change? Not the protein. Amino acids make up the protein. What changed? What's this stuff? What are T's, G's, and C's? That's the genotype. That's the DNA. The DNA changed. The genotype changed. It mutated. But the phenotype, the physical expression, what amino acid to make that protein did not change. And that's because of that redundancy in the code, right? Where we have 61 different codes for only 20 amino acids. So there's a little bit of wiggle room there, right? Still with me? So for a base substitution, you could end up with a silent mutation, where the genotype changes, but the phenotype does not. The same amino acid gets put there. The next thing that could happen that we saw in the video is that the genotype changes, right? We get a mutation, and the amino acid changes. There's a different amino acid there. We call this a missense mutation because remember sense is the name of the codons, the sense codons that code for amino acids. But in this case, it's a missense. Whoops, we made a mistake, right? So this is where a different amino acid gets put there than the, the original one that was supposed to be there. What effect will this have on a cell? One amino acid in its protein got changed. The whole function could be different, good or bad. Could be bad. Could it be good? Yeah, it depends on the position. It could be good, could be bad. Could it have no effect at all? Absolutely. Just depends on how important this amino acid is to its structure and function. Right? So it could be bad could make it not work at all anymore. It could be good. It could actually have this enzyme work better than it did before. Or it could be bad. There are those three distinct possibilities. And of course the environment is going to determine how good or bad that is depending on the job of that enzyme, that protein for that cell. Now this next one, right, this is the third possibility. So you could have silent, missense, or this one that's called nonsense. And what are nonsense codons? Stop codons. So this is the ribosomes chugging along, right? Just putting amino acid after amino acid, and all of a sudden it gets to this and it does what? It stops. Is that a good thing? You know, that's like, you know, 50 question test, right, and stopping at number 25. You gonna pass that test? No, you only did half of it. So, depending again where this stop codon is, right, if it's halfway into making that protein, is that gonna be a good result? You only made half of the protein. Is that good? How could that ever be good, y'all? Are you ever going to pass a test if you only answer 25 out of 50 questions? No. Even if you got all 25 right, <coughs> that's only 50%. You do understand that, right? So could that ever be good to only make half of a protein? No. So depending on where this stop codon is, Pretty much anywhere than at the very end is bad news, right? Stopping before you're supposed to, this one is usually always bad.
Does that make sense to you guys? So, I mean, this is worse than playing the lottery, right? Whew. I'm sweating over this one. Okay, we could, we could have a silent mutation. Basically just won the lottery, right? What's the chances of that? Not so good, right? Missense mutation, now that one can go either way, right? Good, bad, indifferent. Stop before you're supposed to. Always <clears throat> usually bad news. With me on that one? All right. So the next one is adding or deleting. So I forget which one they do first here. Let's see. Wild type means the normal, most common sequence found in nature, by the way. That's what wild means. Okay. So here's a strip of DNA, right? Um, and then it's messenger RNA, it's transcript, and then the translation into the individual amino acids that will form the protein. So this is how it's supposed to be, right? But obviously we're going to make some changes. So he decides to add an extra step here, right? Extra nucleotide. So we're going to add it in. So let's compare. Uh-oh. So we're good right here, but where the change happened, we get different amino acid, right? And even worse, after that, there's even more change. And we've even got a stop codon, so we're going to stop right here. Three, ami three amino acids in, we're stopping. That's not good. So what happens if we take one out? Remove a step. There's a trend happening here. So again, this is where the change happened. Notice that this amino acid and this amino acid changed. When you remove or add nucleotides, Unless you remove or add an entire code on a group of three, you're always going to mess up the code. You're going to shift the code from that point of the change onward. The most common change that's going to happen from this, what we call frame shift, is a premature stop code on. So adding and removing, if you had a choice between a base substitution and adding and removing, which would you pick? I pick substitution, right? There's a chance something good can come from that, right? With this, any chance that something good is going to happen? Oh, not likely. Not likely, because we're usually going to stop before we're supposed to. We're going to mess up a whole bunch of code. Not just one little amino acid. We're going to mess up a whole segment. Right? So... There's a special type of mutation that results from the adding or removing of one or two base pairs. And we refer to this as a frame shift mutation. And as I said, the bad news with this is it most commonly results in premature stop codons. So sometimes this, this shift is hard for people to understand and see how debilitating it can be. All right, so here again, here's just another example of they added one in, changed that amino acid, this, and then it stopped. And this all has to do with the fact that, remember, we're going to read in groups of three. All right? That's all a ribosome knows, is three nucleotides codon, three nucleotides codon. So if you remove something, he does not know that you removed it, and he could not recognize if it's been added. He's just going to do what he always does, three, 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 three. So other than my bad grammar, these are all three-letter words, right? So synonymous with a codon. 
<laughs> so this sentence, the cat ate the dog. Right? So ribosome, you guys are all ribosomes right now. You're good with this, right? Other than the bad grammar, you can read this. This makes sense to you. I just did something. What did I do? I deleted a letter. What letter did I delete? T. But I did, just like you're supposed to do, you're supposed to only read them in groups of three. Right? So do you see how the entire sentence is messed up? Because I took out one letter at the beginning of the sentence. But remember, you're programmed three. 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 It's the only thing you know how to do. What did I do there? I added one. Again, messed up. I added one at the beginning. Messed up the entire sentence because you're still going to do your usual program. Three letters. Three letters. Three letters. So there's one exception to the adding and removing rule. Right. So if I add the word big, where could I add it and not create so much disruption and maybe make it make a little bit more sense? Yeah, the big cat ate the dog, right? That could happen, <coughs> right? What I did here and what these letters are representing for us are nucleotides and codons, right? Which are then going to be translated by the ribosome into what? What are, what are codons translated into by the ribosome? Amino acids. So what did I essentially just do here? I added an amino acid, right? Because I added the codon in between codons, right? I didn't stick it into one of these words. I put it in between the codons, in between words. I essentially just added an amino acid. I didn't create any shift, did I? No. This is the one exception where you, if you add a whole codon in between codons, you're just going to add an amino acid. Could you do the same? Could you remove a whole amino acid? Yeah, you could remove a whole codon and remove a whole amino acid. Are you going to get a frame shift? Not if you remove a whole codon. You only get shifts, right, is when you insert into codons, right, or you remove one or two. Because remember, the, the sequence is threes. Three, three, three. All right, so here it is in genetic terms. So what are we looking at up here? What is this? It's got T's in it. This is the genotype. This is DNA, right? It's got T's. What's this? This is messenger RNA. Ah, oh, you're waking up. So what are these? Amino acids that will form a protein. Okay, so this is the way it's supposed to be. I made a change. Can you find it? Well, clearly it's longer, so I did what? I added. What did I add? Which amino acid? CAC, you see that right here? In between the arginine and the tyrosine, I added another valine. And notice, different codon, right? Same amino acid, though. No frame shift, right? After that insertion, it's still the same. Tyrosine, valine, lysine, tyrosine, valine, lysine. So the third one in mutations is transposable elements. And these will affect gene ex expression. Because they're going to disrupt the information. So one of the things I don't like about this video, or animation, is the level of detail is not there. But it still kind of gives you a sense of what's going on. So in your 
DNA, or in this case, in this plasmid, right, which is a circular piece of DNA. Here's the chromosome, right, big, long, circular piece of DNA. Each little segment is called a gene, right? It's read by the enzymes. It's made into a messenger RNA. It's read by the ribosome, and you typically are going to make a protein, right? That segment that codes for a particular protein is called a gene. So you have several segments, right, throughout your chromosome or throughout a plasmid, a, a piece of DNA. So they're signifying one gene right here by coding it a different color. So this segment is for a particular protein. This segment here in green is for another protein. But we could, you know, we can make it rainbow colored, right? We could add a whole bunch of different colors for all the different genes. So what happens with transposable elements? They move, right? So here's two transposons. Here's that plasma that comes into the cell. And then the transposable elements moves from the plasma onto the chromosome. And then later, this segment pops off where it is and goes someplace else. But what this one even copies itself and jumps someplace else. What they're not showing you here is when it jumps in here, it doesn't jump in between two protein elements, two genes that are already there. Sometimes it inserts itself right into a segment that's already there. So this one's cute. It shows you things jumping around and moving, but it's not giving us the level of detail that we need. So there are special segments of DNA that move spontaneously from gene to gene, right? So from segment of the chromosome to another, called transposons. The problem here is they disrupt the proper function of the gene they jumped into. So I'll give you a real-world example in a moment. So this has got a little bit more detail. So here are two um, plasmids. So here, see how they have it all divided up into little segments? And so here they've got it numbered. So one, two, and three, these are genes. These code for a particular protein, say. This whole segment of these three genes can pop off of here and jump into this plasmid. But when they jump in, notice that they insert into B. They split B in half, essentially. The problem with that is B now is on either side of this element 1, 2, 3. When the enzymes go to read this information, they don't know this happened, right? They're going to make a messenger RNA to be able to make B. They're not going to start here, jump over here, and finish it. Instead, that cell is no longer going to make B. B is done. It's been disrupted by this element 1, 2, 3. Does that make sense to you guys? So we've essentially knocked out or deleted B by this transposable element jumping into it and disrupting it. So how is it going to what? It's not. B's, B is not going to be used by that cell. Under these conditions, whatever B codes for, it's not doing it anymore. Yep. Yep. It'll copy 1, 2, and 3, that transposable element, depending on what that stuff is. Remember, this stuff is under control. Right? So if the cell needs that information, if it needs B, though, it's not going to be able to do it. It can't do it anymore. So Barbara McKintock, did I put her picture in here? Oh, I put in my other one. So she discovered this phenomenon in maize corn. So maize corn is that corn where it's all different colors. And what corn kernels are are little baby corns, right? Each one of them is an individual embryo. Um, but why were you she, why were you she getting these different colors? Well, it was because transposable elements were turning on and off the different colors in the different embryos, right? These transposable elements, right? If it inserted into a particular color, that one couldn't make that color anymore, where others were able to still make that color because it wasn't disrupted. 
by these transposable elements. So this happens in nature, right? It was observed in nature. But we as scientists use this phenomenon, this ability of genes to disrupt other genes for research purposes. And in fact, there's a whole line of mice that one of the immunologists at LSU Vet School works with, as you can imagine, very expensive mice, <laughs> called knockout mice. And they have a particular gene that is knocked out, right? So they cannot do, and I, 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 at one time I could have told you, but it's been like, too many years. I can't even count anymore how long it's been since I worked with her. But um, so she's studying, you know, how does the immune system work without this ability, right? So she literally has mice that are genetically altered to the level they cannot do that particular function anymore. We use it even on a much smaller scale um, in bacteria, right? So this is an example of knocking out in um, bacteria. So, and, and how we're able to detect that it was successful. So, again, you're going to have a segment of DNA that tells a cell how to do something, right? It has a start and a stop point, so the enzymes will attach. They'll read this DNA. They'll make the messenger RNA. The ribosome will make something. In this case, it's an enzyme that will take a substrate that we give them that's colorless, and that enzyme will break it in, in half, and this molecule will then turn blue, right? So when the two components are together, it's colorless. When it breaks it apart, it's blue. So these bacterial cells have that ability. They come with the ability to make this enzyme. A lot of times we're going to give them DNA something else we want them to make, but we're going to put an additional marker there. Most commonly, we're going to give them antibiotic resistance. So we can grow them under that selective pressure so that only the ones that change are going to grow because we gave them antibiotic resistance. I use penicillin as an example here because most of you guys are familiar that penicillin is an antibiotic, although it's not the one we use. Um, so penicillin doesn't work on E. coli. E. coli is the most commonly used in altered bacteria out there, but it's gram-negative. Penicillin doesn't work on it. So, but it's an antibiotic you guys recognize, the name. So we would give it that information. We'd give it an enzyme to destroy penicillin. And when we, where we insert it is into the gene for the enzyme that's going to convert that substrate into a blue color. So once we insert this, they no longer are going to make that enzyme, right? Notice we disrupted that segment. Enzyme gone. So we'll give it the substrate, but they won't turn blue anymore. But we want to sure, be sure that some other mutation didn't happen. So we're going to grow them in the selective pressure of penicillin. Now the only way they're going to survive is if they have that information we gave them on how to make the enzyme to destroy penicillin. So definitely growing on my plate are going to be just the bacteria where this change happened, right? The antibiotics is going to kill off everybody who didn't change. And I'm going to have confirmation, too, because he's not blue, which means that he can't metabolize that substrate with the enzyme anymore. When I did this type of manipulation in lab, I was using a, what's called a construct and I literally took DNA from a frog, right? <clears throat> took DNA from a frog, introduced it into a plasma, a circular piece of DNA, a construct, and then stuck it into the bacteria. The bacteria makes copies of the DNA, you lyse the bacteria, take out the DNA, and then you run it on the sequencer and find out what the code is. Right? So bacteria are very cheap for making copies of very big pieces of DNA. Now we have, anyone ever heard of polymerase chain reaction? Right, PCR. Um, and we just got in a real-time PCR, if you like that kind of stuff, genetic stuff, right? We have the Science Laboratory Technology Program now here at Delgado. Um, and biotech, they've got all these cool machines that can do things like that. 
Um, but they can't, they can't copy really huge pieces of DNA um, and those types of things. So scientists still, even to this day, will use bacteria to literally just make copies of DNA, lots of copies, so that we can then sequence um, the DNA and find out that code. Uh, so I did that for three different frogs, for three different genes that are very important for um, step in your immunological process of making your antibodies. Those proteins that actually take apart your DNA and put it together, rearrange it to make the different antibodies that your body makes. Pretty cool stuff. All right, so um, we'll pick up here next time. All right, um, and continue working on that page, right? Um, chemicals used to clean, right? Filling in our chart and figuring out about those things.